Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxa, and this is Superhouse. I'm standing outside the door of my home office, which is also my home workshop, and this is the door lock that I showed you in the last episode. You might remember I retrofitted this lock so that it could be controlled by the home automation system. That means that the home automation controller can send events to the door to say lock or unlock, whatever. And it means that once you've got control over something, you can link it to a phone. So I can use my phone to lock or unlock the door, or it could be controlled from touch screens around the house. Or I can control it via the internet. Really, once you've got things linked together, you can do all sorts of cool stuff. So now that we have control over this door lock, what we can do is add other inputs or other methods of controlling it. What I'm going to do in this episode is show you how I'm going to use RFID to control access to this door. Over on the wall here, you can see that I've already cabled through. This is Ethernet, which runs through to the Ethernet switch, which is in the switchboard you've seen previously. It's powered up using power over Ethernet, and it's all ready to mount an RFID reader. So what I'm going to do in this episode is show you how I'm going to put together an RFID reader, mount it in the wall here, so that when authorized tags are scanned, which will include the tag that I have surgically implanted in my arm, the door will unlock. But first, I need to give you a bit of a background on RFID. There are a lot of misconceptions about what it is and how it works. So time for a little history lesson. In 1940, the world was at war and the German Air Force sent thousands of sorties across the English Channel to drop bombs on English cities. This obviously was a big problem. So the British Defence Department came up with a plan for being able to defend against these incoming attacks. The problem they had was that a lot of the attacks would occur either at night or in poor visibility, lots of cloud cover. So they, the anti-aircraft gunners could not necessarily see the targets very well. And what they did was implement a series of guidance radars along the British shoreline. So what would happen is as a German aircraft came in over the channel, it would be picked up by radar emplacements that were sitting along the shore. Now the radar emplacements would detect that there was an incoming aircraft and they would relay that information to anti-aircraft guns. Those guns could then use the tracking information from the radar to predictively fire shells into the path of the incoming aircraft and hopefully destroy them. Now the problem is this could happen over a distance of many, many kilometres. The aircraft might be totally out of sight, out of hearing of the gunners. So they are working on information that's being fed to them by a targeting radar system that simply identifies a blip saying there is something coming in. But how do you know if that's a German bomber or if it's a British aircraft that is returning home after a sortie out over the channel? So what they did was implement a system called IFF, or Identify Friend and Foe. And this is a system that's still in use today. So what they do is have a radio transmitter that regularly sends out challenges. And when they detect an incoming aircraft, they would send out a coded transmission, which is the IFF challenge. That's the Identify Friend or Foe challenge. If the aircraft fails to respond to that challenge, you assume that it's an enemy and you try to shoot it down. If the aircraft responds and their response is suitable, so they know the particular code that's required for the response, then you take it as a friend and you leave it be. And this is the origin of RFID. This is how it all came about. And in fact, this is very similar to a system that's probably in use in your car. And I'll get to that in just a moment. Now the way this worked, because they needed this to work over a very long range, was a system that we now call Active RFID. Now the way Active RFID works is you have a, uh, essentially a, a thing like a card reader, it's equivalent to what we would call an RFID reader. And it has a transmitter and a receiver. So it sends out a signal which is received on the aircraft on an antenna and goes into a radio receiver. The output of that signal then goes into a little bit of logic. And what this does is process the signal, determine whether it recognizes the particular code, 
see if it's one that it needs to respond to. If it does, and it's a challenge that is verified, it's a challenge that it recognizes, it then uses a transmitter to send back the response. Now, because this uses an active receiver and an active transmitter, there is a power supply on board the aircraft. It means that you can transmit very long ranges. So this system can work over many, many kilometers. Basically, you're limited only by the range of the transmitter that you have on the aircraft and how sensitive you are in terms of being able to receive the challenge. So this can happen while aircraft are many kilometers out and coming back in over the, British, over the English Channel. Now, this relies on a local power supply. So that's why we call it active RFID. It has active electronics on here that transmit the signal back. Now, we also have passive RFID. This is a development that came later and it's very, very clever. What it does is use an energy harvesting technique to take power from the reader and use it within the tag itself. So if we have an RFID reader, typically what it will do is have a, a reader coil and that coil will be generating an electromagnetic field. Now the RFID tag itself also has a coil in it and it will have something like a batter, uh, like a uh, capacitor, a little energy storage system. And because it is within this electromagnetic field, if it's tuned to a particular frequency of the field, then you will have a voltage that is generated across that coil. And in fact, if you look at the two halves of an RFID system with the reader and the tag, you'll see that it's actually just a transformer. It happens to be a transformer that's missing the, um, all the metal structure that normally binds the magnetic field together much more efficiently but it is still using two coils that are coupled using an electromagnetic field. Now by generating a voltage across the coil at this end, that can then be used to power up some logic. And that might be very simple. It's not necessarily as complex as a microcontroller. It's just some very simple logic that when it receives a challenge, it looks up a little number in its ROM and it knows that that is the number that it has to send back. And that is the ID that is in the RFID tag. Now the way that works is that now that this is powered up, it's got enough power that's been harvested from the antenna, it can then apply modulation to its own antenna, which then modulates the electromagnetic field being generated by the reader, and the reader can detect that modulation in its own coil. So it's a bi-directional system. It's using the same coils at both ends as the transmitter from the reader, and then received here at the coil, at, which is in the tag and then the signal is sent back to the reader as well. So it's a, a two-way handshake system. The reader sends out the modulation which is constant and the challenge and the RFID tag which is all self-contained in some handy little format then modulates the signal and sends back its ID. And that really is how RFID works in the common case today. Most RFID systems, in terms of number of units or number of tags produced, are passive systems like this, not active. Now the reason for that is obvious. There's no battery here. This thing will last theoretically forever. Whereas the battery in an active RFID system will run down. Even if it's turned off most of the time and you use um, energy conservation techniques such as only powering up and when you detect an incoming um, signal or an incoming challenge, you still have a finite life. You have a shelf life of the battery, which might be, you know, it could be five years or seven years, but eventually it's going to die. Whereas a passive tag like this, this could keep going for decades. It requires no maintenance, um, no chemicals, no problem. So active RFID is great if you want a long read range. Passive RFID is great if you want short read range but super low cost and high reliability in the tags themselves. Now, tags for passive RFID systems come in a whole lot of form factors. And in fact, you're probably carrying a bunch of them right now. So if I look in my wallet, and I didn't set this up, this is just what I happen to have in my wallet right now. I have a building access pass. This is my access pass for the Primus data center. That looks a bit like a credit card. It's the same size as a credit card. You've probably got something similar to get into office buildings. 
Um, I have another one which is blank, so it doesn't give away any, any identity, which is my access pass for Internet Vision Technologies, which is my software company. I also happen to have a TransLink card in here, which is from Queensland. So this is a mass transit card. It's one of those tap on, tap off mass transit cards. So it's a stored value system. I have another one here, which is a Mikey card from Victoria. Once again, you top up your Mikey account and this is an RFID tag. So if you are carrying around mass transit cards, you probably have RFID tags on you right now. So I had four in my wallet right then without even trying. Most people nowadays are walking around with RFID on their person, possibly sewn into their clothes, and they're not even aware of it. But it's all around us. Other form factors, and one of the, um, the ones that you may not notice, what do you see here are actually two tags. There is, the obvious one across the front is the plastic strip. That is an anti-theft tag. That's been put on top of a square sticker that you can just see. And these are pretty commonly used on things like razor blades, um, anything in a retail store that is small but moderately high value uh, as a um, theft prevention system and also for stock management. That square tag that you can see back behind it is a sticky label and these can be produced in large volumes for fractions of a cent. They are really, really cheap because they are made in such big numbers. If you look carefully at it, you will see that there is actually a coil that is etched or that is made out of copper within that. So that whole square that you see is a coil and that is the receiver on the RFID tag that then powers up the little microchip in it and that's what sends back the signal in response to the challenge. Other form factors, you can get them in key fob style and this is the one that most people find interesting. It's tiny it's about the size of a grain of rice and probably can't focus, but that is an implantable RFID tag. And this particular model is 12.2 millimeters long, 2.2 millimeters diameter. It's coated in a material called Paraline, which is slightly porous, and it's made out of soda glass, which is a non-reactive uh, material that is safe to put inside a body. So these are implanted inside the, uh, the back of the neck of dogs and cats and other pets. That is a particular type of tag that I have implanted in my arm. So now let's look at reader technology and I'll show you how to hook up an Arduino so that we can read these tags and do something useful with the information. Here on my workbench, I have four RFID readers which are all suitable for interfacing with an Arduino. Now these are all low frequency readers. One of the things you have to understand when picking a reader and tag for RFID is that there are so many different standards in terms of things like the frequencies that are used, the modulation schemes, the data structure, that you have to be very careful to match the reader to the particular type of tag. Now the one over on the left here, which is very popular, is called an RDM630. This is a reader that I featured in Practical Arduino. You can see the coil over here, it's an external coil. So what you do is connect this using a serial interface, it has a 5 volt logic level um, UART on it, so you just connect that and you can use either the hardware UART on the Arduino or the software serial library and receive data. So this module does all of the hard work of polling for tags. It takes the result and processes it and then it just gives you a stream of digits out of the, um, the serial port that you can read. So very simple to use. Now this particular module works at 125 kilohertz which is the common frequency used for low frequency tags in the hobby market. This other module, the ID12 module from um, ID Innovations, is very similar. It's functionally similar, it's just that it's in a nice little potted block, so it's really robust. Once again, it has a serial interface. You can power it up, talk to it using serial. Because it's all integrated, it's got the coil inside the package here. It's nice and robust. You can build it into things and uh, and it's pretty good. Once again, that's 125 kilohertz. Now the thing is that the RFID tag that I have implanted in my arm doesn't run at 125 kilohertz. It runs at 134.2, which is the international standard for implantable RFID. That means I can't use the cheap hobby grade RFID readers that are around the place. You could if you were just using a regular RFID tag, 
Um, but unfortunately, I have to have something that will read the implantable tag. So these are the modules that I've been using for a few years now. This is a module from ACG. Um, it's a German manufactured module. You can see that I've hacked this one a little bit. It's got some connectors on it. Um, it's got a hand wound external coil because these modules aren't supplied with any coils. And they're also very expensive. When I first bought these modules, I think about seven years ago, they were in the order of $80 each. And when I followed up more recently to buy some more, they'd gone up to about $240. You compare that to the fact that you can buy one of these for $10, and it's quite a difference. Unfortunately, I need the 134.2 kilohertz. And then just recently, I came across a Melbourne-based company called Priority One Design that make a number of RFID readers, including this one. It's a really neat little unit. It's physically quite similar to the ID Innovations module, but this one is designed to operate at 134.2 kilohertz, and it works perfectly with implantable tags. So, and it's really cheap. Like it's in the order of um, 30 something dollars, I believe. So um, once again, it has a serial output. So we just need to power it up and then we'll have serial comms that we can read from the Arduino. Very easy. So what I'm going to do is mount one of these behind a wall plate and fit that next to the door, next to my, uh, my office door. And what I'm going to do is connect all of this to an Arduino. So in this particular project, I'm going to use an Ether 10, which is basically an Arduino compatible board with onboard Ethernet. You could do the same thing with a regular Arduino and an Ethernet shield. This just keeps it all neat and integrated. It also supports power over Ethernet. This is the PoE module. And what happens is that power is provided via the network connection. Um, comes down at a nominal 44 volts. So it's in a sort of 44 to 48 volt region. This is a switch mode voltage regulator that cuts it down to seven and a half volts and supplies it into the input of the voltage regulator on the Arduino. And that way the Arduino can simply plug into the network cable powers up and it's alive on the network. Everything is ready to go. So what I'm going to do next is combine this with a prototyping shield and I'm going to link that onto this. And um, I'm also going to fit a little MAC address chip. One of the annoying things about using an Arduino on the network is that you need to specify the MAC address in the sketch. So um, what I've just been doing recently is using a MAC address chip and um, it's guaranteed to have a unique address. So by wiring that up to the prototyping shield, what I'll be able to do is have this device power up, read the MAC address, and then identify itself on the network using that. And that way I don't have to keep a track of addresses inside all of the sketches. I have a prototyping shield here, which I have cut, as you can see, into a U shape. That's because I need it to fit around the power over ethernet regulator. This way it's going to clear nicely and I can still fit the connectors and various other parts that I want. I'm using all surface mount parts here, so I'm working under a microscope, but I'm still just using the regular 0.1 inch pitch grid. Just on here is a SOT23 format Ethernet um, MAC address chip, and I've just aligned it so that a couple of the pins are bent up out of the way. Others I have bridged across onto these um, prototyping holes. So, you know, this sort of stuff, it's much easier to do under the microscope. You can do it with your um, bare eye. So what I'm going to do now is add a couple of 4K7 pull-up resistors because this is an I2C chip and um, I need to have pull-ups for I2C to work. Now we've just jumped forward an entire day because last night when I was finishing up this shield with the connections for the RFID reader, I was looking at how to hook up the cables to the reader itself and I didn't want to just solder straight onto the pins because that would be a little bit uh, prone to breakage. So I quickly jumped onto Eagle, laid out a little breakout board, and I've just etched it. So I now have the RFID module mounted. It's got connections for the um, serial and power coming through this cable. There are status LEDs, so red normally, and then it goes green if it gets a successful read. There's some surface mount parts on the back. There's a little uh, current limiting resistor for the LEDs as a capacitor. So we are now in a position where we can fit all this together. Oh yeah, and what I'm going to do is mount it behind this blanking plate. This is just like a PowerPoint plate, but with nothing on it. And what I intend to do is drill a couple of three millimeter holes for the LEDs. This module will mount behind it like this, and the LEDs will be visible through the holes. But even without that, we can test this right now. Because what I can do is fit the shield 
to this Ether 10. I can plug the module into the shield. So we have all the connections in place. And I just need some power. And this is a little implantable RFID tag. I have an Ethernet cable over here, which is connected to a switch that has power over Ethernet. So if I plug that in, it all powers up. So as you can see, the reader is now alive. Now this has got nothing to do with the software that's running on the Arduino. This is just powering up the module, which is showing the status there. And if I take this little implantable RFID tag and move it nearby, you can see we've got a successful read. The red LED goes out, green LED turns on. That shows that the RFID reader is detecting and reading the value from this tag and sending it via serial back to the Ether 10, which right now is ignoring it. So the next step is to mount this inside that wall plate so it's all nicely mounted and then work on some software for this. Now the software that we need to run on the Arduino will depend very much on how the door is set up and integrated to the rest of the system. If you are building a standalone RFID controller, there is a really simple way to approach this. If you have an electronic strike plate, for example, attached to your door lock, what you can do is have the RFID reader, um, in our case the micro RFID module, connected to the Arduino, which can then control the strike plate using a relay or a FET or something like that. What that means is that the sketch inside the Arduino simply looks for values coming back from the RFID reader, does a little internal lookup to see if it matches an allowed tag, and then unlocks the door if it's allowed to. I'm not going to do that because I have a slightly different objective. Now, my, um, my door lock, as you saw from the last episode, is controlled via the existing home automation system using a little RF remote. So the lock itself is one of those Lockwood Nexium locks. And what I have mounted um, not too far away is an Arduino, so actually an Ether 10 with built-in Ethernet. And that is connected to the little key fob transmitter for the door lock. And it is also connected via Ethernet to my LAN. And what that means is that by sending commands to this Ether 10, it can effectively press the buttons on the remote and unlock the door under software control. Now elsewhere on the network, I have my home automation controller, which obviously is connected to the LAN. And that's how I can use my iPhone or a tablet or an Android phone or whatever to unlock the door. It sends a signal to the home automation controller, goes through the network and sends the signal. Because I have all of this in place, what I'm going to do with the RFID reader is a little bit different. What I'm going to do is mount the RFID reader near the door and have that connected to an Arduino, once again an Ether 10, and that is going to connect to the LAN. So the RFID reader will not have any direct connection to the door lock. In fact, it doesn't even need to know anything about the tags that it's reading. All it needs to do is read a tag, so it needs a serial connection from the reader, then connect to the network and send that value to the home automation controller. Then there can be some logic that looks up whether the particular tag is allowed to access this the room, whether it's within a certain time period. For example, you might want to say, these tags are only allowed to access this particular part of the building within certain hours. If all of those rules are followed, it can then send a command back to the Arduino connected to the door lock, which then unlocks the door. So let's have a look at the software. The sketch to run on the Arduino connected to the RFID reader is fairly simple. First what we do is configure the software serial connection to the reader itself. This uses different pins to the normal hardware UART, so we have to define them. I also have the MAC address chip on the board, so what I do here is set up the connection to read from that. This gives us the MAC address to use to connect to the network. If you don't have the MAC address chip, you can simply hard code the MAC in the array. There's also some configuration for the network. We need to tell it the ID of this particular panel. In my case, I have multiple RFID readers, and this tells us which reader we're talking about. There's also the address of the home automation server. Then we have some definitions here for the data that will be read from RFID. We'll look at those in a second. First we set up a serial connection for debugging purposes and then read from the MAC address chip. You can just leave this bit out if you don't need it. Then we set up the actual connection to the network and because the WISNET Ethernet chip sometimes have a bit of a problem if they um, aren't given time to initialize, we wait for a second. 
Then we begin the serial connection to the actual RFID module. Inside the loop, it continuously looks for available data. So we check whether there are any bytes to read from the RFID reader. And if there are, then we start reading from the tag. If we've managed to get a byte, so if we have a positive result back from reading the tag, then we call this function, which is send tag ID to server. And there is also a local print there, so you can see for debugging purposes. Lower down in the loop, we have some, inf some sections here that process data for the HTTP connection. <clears throat> this is using the web client to process data that's sent back by the web server and to send data to the server. Next we have a function called read tag. This is very simple. It's basically just a loop that keeps taking bytes in until it reaches the end byte. Back at the start of the sketch we defined end byte. In this case it's hex value 13. We're going to put all of the data into the tag array variable and this is the length that we expect it to be. And if it gets a successful read it returns true. Once we have the value we need to call send tag ID to server, which is just what we saw a moment ago. What this one does is simply open an HTTP connection to a remote server. What we do is send the button ID and then the a delimiter and then the tag. And that way the script at the other end running on the server can see what the tag is. Finally we have a utility function which is used for reading values from the MAC address chip. So here we are right back where we started the episode. Electronic door lock is in place. Now we have an RFID reader connected here. And I have in my hand an implantable RFID tag. So if I hold that in front of the reader you'll see the green LED comes on and the door unlocks. Perfect. And of course it will also work with the tag that's implanted in my arm. Now I'll just hold this other tag away for a while. If I step in front of the reader so there's nothing here, nothing on my arm. Move it nearby. You can see it's read it correctly and now it's let me in. So I can now walk up and unlock the door with nothing in my hands. Now remember earlier that I said that the technology in your car is very similar to a World War II bomber. Now the reason for that is a lot of cars now have e-tags in them which are used for toll, um, toll access. As you're driving along a tollway and the little tag beeps at you to tell you that you've just been scanned by one of those toll towers, that is the exact same technology that is used to identify World War II bombers flying back over the English Channel. It's an active RFID tag and the gantry that's over the road sends out the challenge. Your car then responds exactly the same way as the World War II bomber. So next time you're driving down the freeway, just imagine you're flying a big four-engine aircraft. See you next time.